Digital Society School activates your potential to positively impact the digital transformation of society. We do this by building and facilitating truly transformational learning experiences. Learn how to obtain a responsible, inclusive mindset, how to integrate technology in society, and how to design for the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Work within multidisciplinary, multicultural teams with partners from industry and society on the most urgent and relevant challenges. Digital Society School is a unique online and offline training ground for a new generation of leaders in a digital world. We explore more responsible ways to use the global digital transformation for the benefit of society. This is Dear Future, I'm Ready, brought to you by Digital Society School from Amsterdam. Good afternoon, good morning, and good evening for those international viewers. My name is Marco van Hout, I'm Creative Director of Digital Society School, and welcome to our signature event of the year, and at least uh, the first signature event of the year in 2021, our uh, biannual uh, showcase. This is a really special occasion because of course uh, we can't be together. That's why I asked for a lot of people to join me on stage. Everybody from the Digital Side School and uh, from our community joined us. And each and every one from this uh, virtual stage I will speak to today. Um, as you know, of course, we are living in a complex world and uh, it might even feel more complex than it used to before. And that is because, um, of course, we are in this pandemic. But complexity is something that we do to ourselves. Of course, we now feel a victim of it, but at the same time, we as human beings, we organize complexity to solve problems. However, it is uh, true that um, um, despite, of course, all our best intentions, this complexity comes with an ever-growing cost. And we are now seeing the sometimes absurdity or, uh, you know, things that are not right about our systems and the complexity that we have created. And as, for example, Bruce Mao, a famous designer, mentioned, wicked problems like this, they need wicked teams to work on. And another uh, famous author, uh, Douglas Rushkoff, he also mentions, find the others in his book, which is a phenomenal book, Team Human. And I want to highlight this because this means that this complexity and the absurdity of our systems is something we can work on, but we can't work on it alone. We have to do that together. And that's why I ask all of these people to join me. Um, I see most of the people are on black, but um, they are actually live beings in, uh, in, in, in color. And uh, we can't do this alone. And that's why at Digital Society School, we do things not alone. We team up. We uh, create teams together of diverse groups of talent. We work with partners from outside of our university. And we work with a large community around the world um, that joins us in actually trying to tackle these wicked problems as a wicked team. So um, transformation design is something that we preach and it's something that we practice. And transformation design is not only about systems and systemical, it's also about um, um, uh, being um, focused on dynamic solutions. So not only on uh, fixed solutions and fixing the past, but really about dynamic solutions that actually are focused on the future. So instead of fixing the past, we are trying to create the future. And that's why we also called this showcase, Dear Future, I'm Ready, because not only will you see projects from our trainees in digital transformation design that are ready for the future, but also because we really focus on this transformation design and trying to create this future together. So um, it's about time that I introduce you to my co-host, Jeroen Groeneveld, who is here to actually moderate the chat and also explain you a little bit more about the platform that you're on, Hop In. Jeroen. Good afternoon, good morning, and good evening, everybody. Um, welcome to Hopin. Uh, welcome to the Digital Society Schools Showcase. 
Uh, I am Jeroen Groeneveld, Talent and Process Coordinator here at Digital Society School, and it's my pleasure to introduce to you this phenomenal platform that we're using today. Um, on the left side of your screen, you will see a menu uh, that is subdivided in different sections. You are at the stage currently. Uh, below that, you can see sessions, networking, and expo. In the sessions section, you will find, uh, starting at quarter past three, the different teams presenting their projects. Mm. These will be presented in 15-minute intervals, so you can visit all of them if you want. At the stage, at quarter past three, we'll have a talk show for the duration of the event, if that is more your liking. And for all you bumblebees out there, we have the expo, where you can, at your leisure, explore all the projects, maybe get inspired with questions for the teams, and then afterwards visit the teams. At the end of uh, the program, I have tacked on an extra half an hour for you, in just in case you've mixed so missed some of the booths so that you can explore the prototypes and look at the videos. So uh, we have until f uh, half past five to explore all the projects. Now, before I hand it back to Marco and uh, our speakers, I wanted to you to take with you for now a question and give it a minute or two to think about and then answer me in stage chat. Um, and the question is, since March of last year, how many consecutive days did you walk a hundred paces or less? So think about that, share your answer in uh, stage chat, um, which also gives me an opportunity to talk about the different types of chat. You have event chat and stage chat. Stage is local, event chat is basically shouting over the entire floor. Everybody can hear and see you. So uh, please keep that in mind when you chat. Uh, and now it's back to you, Marco. Yeah, I'm trying to uh, figure out teams. And as you know, of course, this is a digital era and it's a pandemic era. So we are always fixing things in e even though we want to create that future. Yep. Uh, please, everybody in teams, um, switch off the camera. And I would also only ask Frank Kressin to switch it on. Hi, Frank. Hi there. Hi, Marco. Yeah. Hi, everybody. Frank is uh, the Dean of the Faculty of Digital Media and Creative Industries and of course one of our biggest supporters and uh, well, I might even call him a fan. Um, Frank, welcome uh, to the stage, uh, the virtual stage here um, in the Leeuwenburg in Amsterdam. Um, it's wonderful that you can join us. Can you yeah. explain a little bit about what the pandemic has done with you of course personally but also with us as an institution? Yeah, well, to start with myself, um, of course, I really don't like it. It has been long enough that we have si been sitting in these chairs. Uh, I know many of you have done the same, many of you even caring for children or elderly or people that are ill or being ill yourself. And this is not a place, a nice place to find yourself in. And that said, crises like these are probably the most important and most effective ways to actually change your behavior as an individual, a group or even a society. And we've also seen that at our institute, uh, the Hogeschool van Amsterdam, our faculty, that uh, in a very short time people have adapted, found new ways to do the things they did, but even found new things to do. Uh, getting the education and sometimes the research as well on a higher level. And, and this is very hopeful and I've seen many in interesting instances of projects or approaches or tools or interactions that are really inspiring. Uh, that said, uh, the longer this takes, the, the harder it becomes, the harder it becomes for, for uh, I think, our colleagues and our students to, uh, to keep motivated. So I do hope and I trust that this time will go over soon. Yeah, well, I hope the same <laughs> with you, Frank. And um, so, of course, we, we even notice the digital society that we live in even more uh, ever than before, I think. What, what do you hope personally, and perhaps also as a dean of a faculty of digital media, uh, that we will have learned of the digital society as a digital society of this pandemic? What, what should stick in, in your uh, opinion? I think for me, the most important thing is that uh, we are actually able to change society in a massive way. So if you look at how fast society has totally changed our way of travel, our way of working, our way of studying, our way of being yeah. overnight, that is sometimes, it's also hopeful. It's very hopeful because uh, this pandemic will eventually pass. Yeah. 
-hmm. uh, and I hope sooner, the sooner the better, but it will pass. But climate change is one of the big problems that we actually are having as a, uh, as a society and, and I think even as a planet. That is not going away. So it's supposed to be like uh, winter now, but if you look outside you see it's clearly not. And this mm -hmm. is just a small token of the fact that the climate is really changing ha rapidly. But if we can change as a society in a pandemic, uh, uh, freeing up like billions of money, billions of euros and billions of dollars to change this or trillions. That means we can also do so for this even much more, a li little bit less apparent, but much more urgent threat, I think, that is climate change. And mm -hmm. it's hopeful. We can do this and we should. The sooner the better. Yeah, this is a wonderful statement that I uh, completely <laughs> underline also. And as Digital Society School, uh, as, as you know, of course, we want to have impact on the world around us, but also uh, one of our uh, well, biggest assignments within the University of Applied Sciences of Amsterdam is that we have impact on education and on the, the education climate <laughs> as, uh, to, keep your, to stay in your own worlds and terms. Um, mm. What do you see as our biggest opportunities as Digital Science School to actually influence that climate? Well, uh, I think you have found new ways for education. Uh, you have found new ways to actually apply transdisciplinary research, uh, research and development in practice. Mm -hmm. You have found new ways to collaborate with partners that are coming back and back. So you're clearly doing something wonderful there. Uh, and you've also, I think your whole educational model, working with trainees instead of students, is very inspiring. So that is all the good thing. Yeah. Uh, and then again, uh, you know, I'm a big fan and I want the Digital Society School and the faculty to really prosper. And that means that that there is a, a draw, not maybe a drawback, but a pitfall. Mm -hmm. And the pitfall is that you move so fast ahead that that you might forget that we have this huge institute with 50,000 students that is lagging behind. Yeah. So somehow I would urge you to always look back and make the connection because first of all, you'll have impact on your own students. But if you then also have impact on the institutes, and I'm here to help, I'm really a fan, uh, that, that means that uh, we will change systemically the way we are operating. And that will then benefit all our employees and all our students. And that is a huge thing to do. Wonderful, yeah, and of course also this I underline and I know that we have been working hard, very hard on achieving at least uh, the right direction in this uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the past year. And also, I think, and also I think even the pandemic has helped us in that. Huh? So do you also see that, that, um, that going online, uh, going digital, so to speak, is, is um, of course um, yeah, perhaps a kind of a, a way out of the pitfall for us and um, um, yeah, if you yeah. talk about emergency uh, education in the university at the moment, what uh, do you see for us as a role as Digital Society School to influence that kind of change uh, afterwards? Well, personally, I think you already have. Mm -hmm. Because uh, of your advancements in online and blended education yeah. and also the, the underlying model there, you have been able to come up with, with courses and trainings and support and coaching for many of our stu our teachers, mm -hmm. our teachers uh, and our staff. And they have been well, like attracted to these courses, as you know, and I think they found a lot of value in there. And you have some brilliant teachers that have been able so far to really inspire them. But I also urge you to apply your model of future thinking on, of making the future happen, apply it also to the vision of what the university should be in the near future. So what I would like to do is, is bring your best people and some of the students and then rethink education in five or 10 years from now so we can gradually go there. You are a big institute, so it takes some time to get there. But when, once we get moving, we really, we, we know how to get there. Wonderful. And I, I would like you to help us there. Wonderful. Well, um, count us in. <laughs> and these are, of course, also very nice and valuable words for us as Digital Science School. But uh, our trainees, they are ready for the future. Uh, do you also have some words of wisdom for them and words of optimism? Because I know you as a very optimistic person. So, <laughs> Well, thank you very much. Well, well, well first of all, I, I would like to thank those trainees and those students, but also, of course, the employees, the, your colleagues, our colleagues that are in the society, digital society school. So really, thank you for coming. And I think it's always 
important to realize that this learning is never over. It was never over in the past, but even much more now, it's not over. So it's just first steps towards this future that you not only are making, but you probably also are that future. And I really hope that by being with us for a while, uh, you have had a, a meaningful learning experience and that will carry you on on your journey. I also hope that you have been able to find new friends, new, uh, expand your network, both in a professional, but also very much in a personal uh, personal sphere. And this network will carry you and hold you and help you in the future. And I really want, and I hope that you will have found and strengthened your sense of agency. That is probably the best that you can get from an education like this. And probably you already had some of that before coming because that's why you chose the Digital Society mm -hmm. School. But the sense of agency means that you and we and us, we feel actually responsible for the way that the world is developing. And although sometimes we only can make a small dent, if we make the right dent, it will actually, it will be noticed and we will make it change for the better. That is my serious belief. And I really hope hope and trust that what Marco and the rest of the team has given you so might help you there. And finally, I would like to thank you also because with each uh, lichting, with each group of new students, we actually learn as much from you as you might learn from us. So that, that is something that you give to us. And I can only really, really thank you very much for bringing your wisdom, your experiences, your power, your agency, your, your energy, sometimes your frustration to, that you brought it to us. And I hope and, and I trust that it will be part of the learning experiences of the people that will follow you here. So thanks again and see you soon, I hope in real life. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Words of wisdom. Thank you so much, Frank. This was a wonderful opening and a really encouragement, I think, for us and also for our trainees. And uh, I thank you for being our first guest in the talk show. And uh, well, I hope to see you soon, indeed, in real life. Really thank you so much. Day. See you soon again. Bye. See you soon, Frank. Bye. So uh, that was Frank Kressin, our Dean of the Faculty of Digital Media and Creative Industries. Um, we are now going to officially split up and that means that we are going to officially open the exposition that will happen on Hopin and you can see the work of the trainees over there, all the projects that we've done with our wonderful partners and we are also going to continue with this talk show with uh, really interesting guests, uh, our program managers from several tracks that we are running uh, for uh, to be exact. Um, they are going to talk to us about the work they've done and also how they see the future. Digital transformation designers uh, that work for us are also joining. And obviously we have a couple of trainees that we found. Um, yeah, they found some space to actually split off from their group for a moment and have a chat with us. Um, Jeroen, do you have some, uh, some interesting <laughs> comments already in the chat uh, from your first question? Well, yes, I do. Uh, fortunately, we are keeping busy and uh, are uh, radically taking uh, care of ourselves and uh, people are not neglecting their movement. Uh, I, on the other hand, have to admit that also due to my sitting down hobbies, I have uh, been uh, less mobile than I would usually be. Uh, but yes, uh, people ha are keeping uh, fit, so that's good to hear. <laughs> um, as is customary with these events, we are already overrunning, so I'm happy that I, I extended the event this morning to uh, half past five. Um, Don't worry, we will manage to, to actually is, find some time this is, somewhere. This is, this is digital <laughs> transformation. I mean, we're yeah. transforming time itself. Um, just a quick reminder, in the left-hand menu, you can find the different sections of uh, the Hopin platform. Use the chat to communicate with each other. Uh, you can also find individuals there to chat with. You can also use the networking option to get connected to a random person if that's your thing. So uh, please explore uh, Hopin and uh, Marco. You have something to say about the program, I believe. So uh, without further ado, I do want to talk now to our trainees. I would like to ask the group of trainees to switch on their camera and Zlatina, our learning experience designer. Welcome everybody. I hope the words of uh, Frank uh, before uh, gave you some encouragement. Um, Zlatina, are you there as well? Hi, Zlatina. Um, I don't hear you yet. Oh, you're muted. Can you unmute yourself? <laughs> I think that's actually the second most used word after Corona. You're, un you're muted. <laughs> 
Hey, uh, Statina, so um, you are our learning experience designer and uh, responsible for the digital transformation intensive program, which our trainees follow for 20 weeks. Can you explain a little bit more about what the program entails and what our trainees go through in that program? Well, the last couple of semesters, our trainees went through something completely different than the usual. <laughs> and I'm extremely grateful for you guys that you um, stuck with us through a roller coaster of things happening. But our program is uh, structured in a way uh, where our trainees work on a project through an entire semester. And during that time, we support them with a program of workshops and trainings that help their uh, work on their projects. So we start with two, uh, two weeks of uh, intensive training preparation where we teach um, our ways of working at DSS, we teach about transformation design, we teach about um, design thinking uh, and all the tools and technologies that we use in Digital Society School. And after that, uh, our trainees split up in teams and start working on their projects in three sprints. And in between those sprints, they have a few days again of intensive workshops where the first, uh, the first few days are called Discovery Jam, where they kind of explore new skills and opportunities for things they could do with their projects. They focus a little bit more on user research and empathy um, and things connected to exploring what the problem is that they're working on. In the second uh, jam that we have, it's called reframing jam, and that's usually focused very heavily on sustainability, ethics, and kind of zooming out and looking at the big picture and systemic picture uh, of, uh, of their projects. And in the final uh, third jam we have, they have uh, trainings on prototyping and making things tangible, which is something they couldn't really do. Um, not as tangible as they usually would, um, but we usually teach them a lot how to use our maker slab facility to make things, how to translate things, not only from a concept, but to an actual prototype. And then they have two, two sprints in the end, which they just prepare for the showcase um, very intensely, and I'm sure uh, the results, if you go to the sessions uh, right now, you will see how amazing they are. This is and wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> We have a community uh, where they help each other across the teams. Um, the community is very energetic usually. Now it's much, much more online. And that's, of course, challenging for everyone. Thank you so much. I do want to ask now the trainees uh, to indeed um, pitch their project for a brief moment. Edis, I see you nodding first. Do you want to go first and uh, introduce your project that you've been working on so hard for 20 weeks? Of course, that we've been working on as a, as a team. Uh, because our project was focused on uh, designing an educational escape room, and then specifically for students from the Hafia entrepreneurship track. Um, it was very important to us, but also uh, for our client, that this sustainable be, uh, escape room be uh, sustainable and including digital technology. Um, sustainable because actually millennials are quite concerned about uh, sustainability nowadays and in escape rooms usually things are quite uh, like easy to break. Mm -hmm. um, so what we did is that in 20 weeks we tested and created a digital prototype of a modular educational escape room and uh, to accompany this we made a training manual for teachers to be able to implement it we uh, had a digital prototype which was actually modular so you're able to put in competencies you find important for someone to learn and we also additionally as a bonus made a sustainability calculator for you to calculate uh, the waste materials in your escape room to make sure they're sustainable according to the circular economy so that's in a, in a tiny nutshell I would <laughs> say <laughs> Thank you, Iris, uh, Iris Brugman uh, uh, of the EdTech for Social Change track. Uh, Youssef, Youssef um, uh, Leba, you are also a trainee and you have been spending your project with the Design Across Cultures track. Could you also briefly introduce your project? Yes, so I've been working with five other people for the last 20 weeks with a project around uh, uh, Design Across Cultures. So how can we uh, create a conversation tool for uh, psychiatric caregivers uh, who are working with uh, asylum seekers in uh, the Netherlands who need uh, psychiatric care. And we've tried to uh, come up with a 
tool that can help the caregivers better understand their patients and give them some type of context in how the patient understands their own uh, situation and so forth. Wonderful. Thank you, Yusef. Uh, also short and, and precise, this, these are real pitch, pitches, uh, everybody. <laughs> Merve uh, Kandemir, you also worked on a project, of course, with the team, as everybody mentioned. Can you also briefly uh, introduce your project? Yeah, uh, my team and I, we worked on fostering an entrepreneurial climate within Havelem and Zandvoort. And uh, to do that, we map out the entrepreneurial ecosystem in th within these two municipalities. And we looked at how can we re redefine the role of the municipality to change it from a practical facilitator to a trusted advisor that really nurtured this entrepreneurial ecosystem by making the ecosystem visible, by raising awareness around all the resources that are available out there for entrepreneurs, I, and by really engaging entrepreneurs uh, in the service creation uh, process of the municipality. Thank you, Merve. <laughs> and uh, because of time, uh, we'll continue to Lainey Preston. Can you also briefly explain your project with your team? Yeah, of course. Um, so the UFA and the HAVEAC uh, came to us in September and told us that they were actively really trying to reduce uh, waste uh, production and consumption on their campuses, but that when they did an analysis, about 70% of the waste on campus came from off campus, so from students bringing it from Albert Hein or to-go shops onto the campus. Mm -hmm. So they wanted us to create a digital platform that could encourage students to reduce their waste consumption. So we designed um, the front end of an application you can use on your phone that gives you rewards um, for completing sustainability challenges that have to do with waste reduction. Mm -hmm. Um, so really trying to make sustainability fun and engaging for students who might not otherwise be super inclined to manage or actively try to reduce their waste consumption. And we're actually going to be working with um, a team of software engineers who are finishing up the ICT miner at the HAVEA to develop the back end so that this app can actually get created and used by students for next fall. So we're super excited about uh, about that. I can tell. I can tell. Thank you, Lini. Um, Richie, Richie, Elia, would you also like to briefly introduce your project and uh, make it commercial, eh, so that people really go to your booths and sessions? <laughs> I'll uh, I'll try, Marco. Uh, yeah. So uh, me and my team, uh, we've been working on a tool uh, to make communities more resilient and inclusive. Uh, specifically, a community in Rotterdam uh, called Middelland. Uh, so we spend some time there talking to uh, residents uh, to figure out what it is that they actually need to have a more inclusive community. Uh, based on the feedback that we got and uh, chats that we had with some wonderful people there, by the way, uh, we developed a platform um, that is supposed to facilitate for offline connections. Uh, it also sort of facilitates connection on its own, but uh, yeah, the focus is a bit on offline as well, so uh, during these pandemic times, that makes it all a bit awkward. But uh, let's hope that will all be over soon, so we can uh, go back to normal lives and uh, chill, <laughs> chill and hang out with our friends. Um, but yeah, basically, we create a platform uh, that helps you to connect with your neighbors uh, and sort of turn them more into friends instead of just neighbors. Uh, so yeah, you don't feel too awkward to knock on your neighbor's door to ask for help with maybe building a website or an app or uh, a shed, who knows? Uh, but that's kind of the point. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Richie, very clear. Uh, and then uh, uh, last but not least, you, Naomi, uh, please also uh, introduce your project and then uh, I'll continue with some more questions. You're muted, the big word. <laughs> yeah. Nice. Um, sure. So, uh, our project is for supporting teachers in vulnerable communities. But you know, because of the pandemic, the, most of the schools are closed are all over the world. It's same as vulnerable communities like Africa. So what we try to do is helping them. So uh, we actually uh, talk to teachers in Africa, specifically for Ghana. Like we talk with them like 16 hours and 20 hours in total. Also visited their online classroom as well and try to understand the situation. And what we learned from them is that like, teachers have no time to wait. 
for government guidelines to adapt this situation. However, in many cases, they don't know how to get the skills and where to ask for the help, even when they have access to the internet. So we consider that this situation is not only for pandemic, but even after the pandemic, probably the other a natural disaster happen, we need to adapt to things quickly. Mm -hmm. So in order to uh, solve these challenges, we created a digital toolbox called Hub Me. So Hub Me, uh, on Hub Me, users can find the ready-made online teaching materials, also can um, go to the online classroom to observe how other teachers are teaching, and also they can get, um, get uh, advice from other mentors. So in this way, uh, teachers get habit to share their knowledge and learn each other. In this way, uh, we will increase the teacher's resilience, resilience and ready for the upcoming challenges. Wonderful. Thank you, Yu. And um, so, of course, uh, we have been talking about uh, experiences, as Latina also really mentioned, experiences is one of our key elements in our program. Um, of course, <laughs> the experiences now um, in this semester have been quite different for you, I guess. How have you guys managed to keep the same level of, you know, togetherness or, um, yeah, to keep the experience as alive as possible? Uh, Iris, can you first uh, react to that? Um, well, what we did is that at the beginning we looked at what we valued as a team together. So obviously you have some rituals which you might have in the office usually uh, and we actually made our own rituals. So we started to uh, have days where we started with gratitude to keep each other connected online and ending the day with meditation. So we actually got quite creative in the way that we operated together and we made sure to have touch points during the day uh, to remain aware of what we were all doing because normally you'd I don't know, go to your colleague and say hi and say what they're up to. Hmm. This time we had to ma basically do that in an organized way. Wonderful. And uh, Merve, did you also meditate? Was that also your key uh, thing in your team? Uh, not really. No? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, our way to gather was really to communicate. We communicate a lot, uh, not just during work, but also after work because we were all new in Amsterdam. So we spend a lot of time together and we really create, I think, a safe environment for us where we're really free to openly communicate when we had problems or we felt down because of the pandemic or any other reason. So our way to connect was really to communicate. Yeah, I get that. Eh? So a lot of communication. Uh, yeah. Well, it works differently than meditation, but still. And um, uh, Lainey, you, you, in your solution, you really talked about rewards. That stuck with me. So did you also, as a team, reward yourself at times so that you could keep going? Yeah, we definitely you know, made sure to reward ourselves. I think something that was really nice within our team dynamic is that we were all really respectful of each other's needs and wants and you know, valued our mental health and happiness just as much as we valued the quality of our work. So we definitely had, you know, some fun team dinners or, you know, if someone really needed a day off, we let them have a day off because ultimately you want to be really resilient as a team in your working style as well, especially when, you know, things are a little bit crazy going on outside. Wow. Yeah, I can imagine. <laughs> hey, so Richie, um, back to you. So um, in the command center, you have such a the headset. It's almost like a command <laughs> center. Hey, so your, your uh, solution, if you would have to take it to the next level, eh? of course you are now showing a prototype in the, in the booth and in the session, but if you would say, well, I have another half year, um, who, what would you need to do to actually get that to the next level and who would you need? Uh, yeah, it's a good question. Almost a bit of a sad question because I wish we had six more months to uh, <laughs> work on this project. <laughs> yeah. But uh, I think right now to really take it to the next level, uh, yeah, uh, our client from our client side, there is already a small development team, but I think it would be nice if, uh, yeah, if we could get even maybe some more, uh, some more creative minds, uh, developing minds, uh, working on the project because we've sort of mainly completed the front end now, and uh, yeah, I think the only thing left now before launch is actually developing the back end of it, uh, and I think once that is done, uh, the app can actually be sent into the world and uh, be used by real people in real communities. Right. Uh, 
which is obviously the end goal. So I would say, uh, yeah, I think developing now is uh, is one of the key things. Wow, thank you. And 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 this is a call for people eh, to join you in your endeavor <laughs> in, in, for this next six yeah, months. For you sure. Never know if there's what any uh, creative minds out there, right. please uh, step on over into our booth and uh, yeah, let us know. Definitely. Hey, going to the other control center, same question for you, Youssef. <laughs> what, what would you project, your project need and who? Uh, great question. I think for us, we did a really good job with our prototype um, and it's been very stimulating to work with it. Uh, but at the end of the day, it, like everything, you need more testing, more mm -hmm. testing and more testing and more testing. And uh, invite the user groups uh, in as much as possible. So that would be uh, the main focus if we had another six months, you know, or 20 weeks. Right. Uh, I would also invite more. We tried to invite some um, nonprofit organizations to help out and give us some expertise. But if we had more time, then we could add even more uh, voices into our project. Right. And, and who of you actually came to Amsterdam, even though they were living somewhere else? Raise your hand, please. So you, a question for you then. Um, coming to Amsterdam, was it worth it in this pandemic? I mean, what, what, why would you actually come here when you could also work somewhere else? That is actually a great question. So I came here to be a designer for social good. And I saw the Digital Society School is an amazing community of professionals who is passionate about making society better. And actually, I met the person and get some network and find more other opportunity to expand. So that was a great decision, I think. So I'm so happy about that. And, and, and who agrees? Who was held? Uh, Merve, you, you also came to Amsterdam. Do you agree with you? Worth it? Yeah, I thought, yeah, it's totally worth it, I think. Because then you feel like you're more involved in the project and it's not just working on a project that is in Amsterdam and you know you feel more collected to the people here once yeah and also in the beginning we had the, the opportunity to meet with uh, the team so that was nice and I was actually expecting that uh, we would be able to work together but yeah that way it was also it was also nice <laughs> well probably we will strategize soon about uh, a way to get you all back <laughs> Once we can open up <laughs> everything again to get a lot of people back, uh, because of course also for the next semester probably we are still in the same situation. So mm -hmm. it's kind of like, uh, you know, a different uh, kind of semester and we would love to have those groups uh, share experiences in real life. Hey, so talking about experiences, um, we have to, uh, this is the final question. Uh, how would you describe if you would have to tweet about it? I hope you already did, but if you would have to make a tweet about your experience with DSS, what, what would you say? Lainey, you have an idea? Or do I put you on the spot? <laughs> <laughs> um, I think I would pretty much just sum it up with the phrase learning curve. This uh, experience was my first professional working experience that I ever had, fresh out of a bachelor's degree. Um, and everything about it, you know, from learning different methods of working to how to work effectively as a team, um, goal, you know, goal defining, all of those things were really new for me. Um, so this whole experience was a huge learning curve, but one that I feel like really developed my skills very thoroughly and, and one that I really felt like made me much more prepared to take on like a professional job. Yeah. Yeah. That, I don't think that was uh, short enough to be a tweet, but... No. <laughs> well, it's kind of like the tweets can be longer nowadays, but still uh, not that long. <laughs> Richie, can you also uh, share your tweet, so to speak? Uh, yeah, so myself, I'm also, I'm still doing a bachelor's degree, but uh, yeah, I would almost agree with Lainey Learning Curve, like uh, this was the first real, real project that uh, me and my teammates worked on all by ourselves. Uh, and yeah, also keep an open mind. Like sometimes things go, things don't go the way you want. But uh, persistence is key, I would say. That's a good tweet. Persistence is key. Hashtag learning curve. <laughs> Hashtag DSS. You, you have a, a similar experience a tweet. Okay, so for me, um, it was like empathy to others. Empathy to everyone everywhere means um, 
I need to emphasize to teachers to make the solution for them and also empathy to teammates to make things motivated all the time in a difficult situation and also empathy to uh, DSS how mm -hmm. to make this happen in the real life so yeah nice we can empathy. we can add hashtag empathy <laughs> Youssef what do you add to the tweet the long tweet the very long tweet um, yes I would say um, DSS is truly diverse in every single way. Um, not just looking at uh, the people here, extremely diverse people. Uh, every person at, in DSS, from trainees to the staff, uh, the partnership organizations that we've worked with, uh, the people that work at those organizations and that I've interviewed, my, my colleagues I've interviewed, it's people from all types of life who've done all types of things. And it's truly amazing to meet all these wonderful people. Thank you. Hashtag diversity. Wonderful. Uh, Merve, what is your hashtag to uh, add? My hashtag would be positive impact. Mm -hmm. uh, because even though this is not my first professional uh, experience, it's really nice to see that there are people out there that really work on making positive impact for the society. So for me, it would be a positive in impact. And uh, dear future, I'm ready. <laughs> ah, nice. That is our general hashtag. <laughs> it is to conclude the hashtags, what would you? I would say rewarding. So in the sense that we got so much freedom to be creative, which I've never experienced in my life before. Thank you so much for that. Mm -hmm. And also the knowledge that we were able to learn via the workshops. Um, but I would also say every day we had our bit of gratitude about DSS and about the work that we were doing. So that also felt rewarding to all of us as a team. Wonderful. Hey, and then back to Zlatina. So we uh, 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 finish the circle. <laughs> uh, Zlatina, if you would have to say something about the trainees and the group of trainees, what would you tweet? Um, I already hashtag diversity in the chat. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Um, yeah, to me, the diversity and the richness of the community of uh, trainees is one of the things that I'm most grateful for about DSS. Um, because every time, even if the program stay, stays the same, the people who join in are the people who actually shape it into what it is. And to me, this community is one of the most rewarding things about DSS. So every time people come to the SS for six months. I'm super excited to see what will come out of that because it's unique. And this richness of experience, expertise, uh, backgrounds, cultures, all of this brings so much innovation and transformation that for me this is the most important thing. Yeah. Thank you so much. Hey, thank you to the whole group uh, of trainees and, and of course also uh, your siblings that are in the session already. Uh, your teammates, uh, please say hi to them. And of course, um, I can't visit them right now, but of course I will uh, view all the projects uh, later on also. Thank you so much. And uh, I really hope that uh, Dear Future I'm Ready really counts for you and that you can make a really nice next step. And hope to see you soon in real life. Thanks everybody. Um, in the meantime, I would like to take the opportunity to highlight a few of our courses because not only do we have a program that focuses on trainees and uh, where we work on projects and design challenges together with partners, but we also train a lot. So people like you see here on the screen, they train companies, they train professionals and they train people who want to actually transform and to have these learning experiences that can have impact on the world. And uh, some of the courses that we are going to launch or are already on our website are Transformation Design, which is a wonderful course that is coming soon. Diversity and Inclusion, the first cohort was already full, but you can already register for March, so please do. Online Education, we have tens and tens of online education modules where you can learn about what online education is and what it needs for the next decade. Uh, speculative Design, where you really focus on future thinking and future building. Critical making, where making is not only building stuff, but also creating conversations that are critical, that are around ethical uh, um, ethics. And sustainability by design, also one of our successful courses that talks about how to actually design for sustainability and for the sustainable development goals of the United Nations. So please go to our website and click on courses and you will find all the information or contact us directly if you want to already register for one of these courses or are interested in one. 
So, systems for sharing. Uh, welcome. <laughs> welcome to, um, to our uh, virtual stage. We have uh, Sofke here in the left. He is a program manager. Um, uh, we have Stefan Ackermans. He's digital transformation designer. We have uh, Jungji Cho on the left uh, bottom. She's also a digital transformation designer. And we have Olina Terzi. Uh, she's also a digital transformation designer in the track. Welcome, everybody. Hey, so um, I want to kick off uh, directly because systems for sharing, what is that all about? And Sobke, would you like to enlighten us a little bit about what is it that your track does and what uh, will you be working on for the, the coming six months? Yeah, gladly. Yeah, many times people uh, get a bit uh, confused by our name or think it's a bit too big, but I can, I can try to make it simple. So our track examine systems, namely design systems. And so that means the ones that people have created. And we are examining systems through uh, the lenses of public values. And that we represent with the value of sharing. So that's systems for sharing, what it stands for. Mm -hmm. uh, we focus on three themes within our track. And this is what we have uh, done uh, for the last uh, two years. So we will continue with that environmental sustainability, and that's led by Stefan, uh, government as a platform, which is led by uh, Lina, and the intersection of art and technology, which is led by Yonji. That's what we do, and those are the themes that we focus on. Uh, this semester, and uh, for the ones who are joining us and would like to go to the booth to check the, uh, the collaboration we have had, we're actually continued with the two partners that we are working with them since the very beginning, and that's the municipality of Harlem and the Department of Waste Management of uh, UVA and Javier, the University of Amsterdam and University of Amsterdam for Applied Sciences. Uh, we have also a new project, Open Up, which we have there two partners, uh, the Milder Lander uh, Het Vijk Bedrijf and the CAT project. And together they do the open up projects and we are very happy with our uh, four partners and now the way we collaborated this uh, this semester i would encourage everyone to go and uh, check the work that have been done by our trainees dtds and partners and uh, it's also opportunity to say thanks a lot for all the effort that have been put uh, into those projects that is a good uh, way to answer and to finish your answer. So uh, obviously you mentioned that you have been working hard for the last uh, two years already on uh, issues around systems for sharing with different partners, with a lot of uh, variety of t teams of trainees, and of course with these wonderful digital transformation designers. Um, and you're working on your legacy, and this is such a big word, legacy. Yeah. So what would you hope that your legacy will actually entail and also have impact on? after you finish it in the next six months? Yeah, well, first, it's a bit sad that we're finishing, but I guess this is also how social trends and uh, technological trends goes. They go up and they go down, and we would need to uh, wrap up our, uh, our track by the end of uh, June. Uh, our plan for documenting our legacy goes into two dimensions. Uh, the first one, is uh, reflecting on a change in systems in four levels, and that's the individual level, team level, community level, and society level. The other dimension will be thematic, and that's to share our expertise on sustainability in system, uh, transformational design in governments, the triangle of art, technology, and society, and the last chapter will be about diversity, narratives, and storytelling. So this is to sum up all the expertise we as people who were working in, uh, in this track have developed in the last two years. And we hope that this knowledge that we, we have gathered will also reflect the values that we as a track would like to bring in the world. We know it's just like few drops in the ocean, uh, but we hope that those would help a few people to make the world a better place. Great. Another one of those nice endings. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Hey, Olina, uh, welcome to the virtual stage. Thanks, Zoe. Um, you are called, I just uh, introduced you as a digital transformation designer, just like the others. And we've been working a lot on this, uh, this concept together. 
But what, how would you explain to someone else what digital transformation design stands for and what is it that you do? Yeah, hi Marco. That's uh, the question that has been, we, we have been trying to answer this question throughout our uh, experience here at DSS. Uh, and I think the, the most important thing about digital transformation design is the diversity of people and uh, perspectives that we have integrated into that. So uh, as digital transformation designers, we come from different uh, disciplines, we come from different parts of the world, but we're all in the same boat of trying to shape society through technology in the most fair um, uh, and uh, best way possible. Um, so what we do uh, within the DSS uh, towards that goal is that we work with external partners and we are trying to preach for a methodology of experimentation uh, within uh, the industry. So taking the concept of learning outside the boundaries of an educational institution uh, as we used to think about learning only within universities and schools, but we're trying to to put that concept into the industry uh, and help them through our exper experiments and our semester projects um, to adopt this trial and error approach at innovation. So that's uh, what we really try to do every semester to start the conversation in these organizations of how they can um, start experimenting, reframing this kind of failure and fear mm -hmm. um, about uh, having things done at once and all correct uh, directly. So I would say, um, yeah, these two big pillars, experimentation and diversity uh, in innovation. I think that's the way that we want to um, to shape uh, the, the society of the future. Uh, and that's what we call transformational design. Thank you. This is very uh, enlightening. <laughs> so um, uh, thanks. Uh, Stefan, you're also a digital transformation designer. And Olina already mentioned uh, diversity as one of the bigger themes that I think we work on also in general in the di digital side school. Um, you also have a background in circular economy and have a focus on sustainability and uh, more and more. But what I see now is that uh, sustainability is a term that has changed actually in the way we use it and the way we refer to it, uh, perhaps under the umbrella of uh, the sustainable development goals, which actually entail everything that we need to work on in the next uh, years. Um, how have you seen sustainability as a concept change and how do you see that also in your work? Yeah, uh, thanks Marco. Um, yeah, so, so sustainability is something that is really close to my heart um, and and then we're talking about environmental sustainability so because as you say uh, sustainability comes in uh, in many forms um, but yeah I'm, I'm very glad that also that um, the, the meaning of sustainability has changed a bit from um, my background is in, in, is in products and design and we no longer only look at you know what material is the best recyclable but um, sustainability has become more of a holistic term mm -hmm. looking um, at the whole system of where can we make uh, the changes. Um, so you mentioned the, the circular economy and we really look now at um, like environmental value retention. So really um, trying to keep uh, the value of whatever you put into the world um, the same value rather than just burning it and uh, uh, make it into smoke, uh, let's <laughs> say. So it's really looking at um, the supply chains, for instance, um, but also how can we create services that perpetuate uses of um, products? So um, how can companies take back their products or how can um, these uh, have a second life? And at Systems for Sharing, we, we really, yeah, it's in the name, we really look at the systems and we have a, a system thinking mindset. So this is also something that we've tried to teach and try to implement in our in our projects ourselves. Um, like, look at all the stakeholders, how can different stakeholders or different angles that we haven't seen yet um, contribute to uh, making, yeah, uh, this a more sustainable world. Yeah, thank you so much, Stefan. And um, indeed, this is also the systemical element to transformation design, as I introduced it before. 
And uh, another element is also to get a very diverse group of people in yeah, so that you team up together and work together. And Jungji, you are um, uh, international yourself, like many others, by the way, in, in the Digital Society School. Uh, you're from South Korea and you came to Amsterdam <laughs> and uh, you have been working also with a multicultural team uh, in your project Open Up. And how would you say that element has influenced the outcome and perhaps also the process in your project? Thank you, Marco. Uh, that's a good question. Um, yes, we are indeed a very multicultural and international team. And I'm really enjoying working with all these unique people. And it did impact a lot on the stages of project shaping and development. Uh, we all have different history of life and cultural backgrounds, and sometimes it made the miscommunication or misunderstandings. And you know, this is sometimes happening. You, you can just feel it, but and also sense it, uh, like the, that something sometimes doesn't feel right. But however, that's where all the transformation and the growth happens. That's the stage you try to be as open as possible to collaborate and co-create better with your team. And it's really about the attitude. Uh, listen not only with your ears, but uh, with your, your full body. Try to open yourself as much as possible and understand the other, embrace the other perspectives and try to make the best synergy and uh, best like impact out of all something that uh, you couldn't really think of but you know like this diverse group mm -hmm. of people come up together to make something new really making something new like, it, it really like it triggers to make something new and innovation that you couldn't really think about before and yeah so i can only say this uh, multicultural and international experience that i'm having in this in only in good ways this uh, co-creation and collaboration process with Multicultural and international team is only uh, like one of my big takeaway from my business life. And on that regards, uh, our team opened up. Uh, their our project uh, that our team did was a great work on how to build on inclusive and diverse community in playful ways. So please check out our team on the session. <laughs> <laughs> well, that is a good ending, also because I would like to, in, for the sake of time. Uh, also continue to if they want to know more about the track uh, they can go to our DSS uh, digital site school.org website click on the track systems for sharing and you will see all these lovely profiles also described uh, in our website thank you all and um, yeah see you soon bye so um, now it's time to actually talk about a new topic and perhaps the topic that Jungji already raised about multicultural diversity is a very nice bridge to the next topic, which talks about design across cultures. Uh, design across cultures track. Please show yourselves. Nick Veroude, he is program manager of the Design Across Cultures track. Annika van Woerden, she <coughs> is uh, impact producer and Anna Arias is in space. No, uh, she is a digital transformation designer in uh, the Design Across Cultures track. <laughs> Welcome everybody. Nice to see you. Um, you don't see me, but you hear me. Uh, first question, uh, like uh, I did with Sofke. Uh, Nick, what is it that your track does? What is, uh, what is it all about? Design across cultures. What does that mean? Hey, Marco. Uh, good to be here. Um, well, the Design Across Cultures track is, uh, is one actually one of the first uh, tracks of the Digital Society School. We've been here since the, the school started. Uh, we've changed our focus quite a bit over the years, but uh, one element has always remained central. Uh, and that is the question, um, how can you use differences, different cultures uh, to design for complex challenges as defined by the Sustainable Development Goals? Um, culture for us is quite broad concept, so we're not only talking about national uh, cultures or generational cultures, but it's also about, uh, about personality, about individuals, about institutional culture. So we like to talk about difference. Mm -hmm. uh, we also are not so much interested to understand these cultures as kind of boxed entities, but for us it's much more about the interaction between these differences. So what happens when you bring these people together, people with different backgrounds, different ideas, different perspectives, uh, and when you bring them together, um, how do you ensure uh, that the process doesn't lead to polarization, to conflict, uh, but to a dialogue where you kind of 
to find a common way forward together. Uh, so difficult questions, especially in this time uh, where people tend to have quite a lot of uh, different ideas and mm -hmm. perspectives on uh, on important uh, important topics. Uh, so those are the kind of topics we work on. We do that internationally and nationally. Uh, internationally, we try to activate people around uh, around the SDGs. Uh, most notably, the SDGs related to health and to climate. Uh, we do that through our uh, big global event, the Global Goals Jam, which Annika will probably talk uh, talk about a little bit uh, in a few minutes. Uh, nationally, we work with uh, the trainee projects, as you will see uh, today in the booths, uh, where we try to develop kind of dialogue platforms or dialogue tools which can kind of facilitate and support these interactions and connections between people. Uh, so that kind of, in a nutshell, is yeah. what we, we try to uh, what we try to achieve. And uh, very interesting, and uh, very close to uh, my heart. Also, this this track. Um, so, Nick, you also mentioned. I think on the website, I've noticed that you talk about designing dialogue at distance, and I love this uh, concept so much. And I thought, wow, this is really on topic at the moment uh, when we talk about the pandemic. So, how do you design dialogue at distance? What does that mean? Yeah, especially it's of in course this a great complexity. Yeah? Uh, everybody, of course, has experience now with working online and using all the tools to communicate with each other, um, which in many situations works quite well. It opens up new possibilities, new ways of interacting, new ways of having conversations. But especially the difficult conversations are quite uh, complex to have online. Eh? Uh, these dialogues with different stakeholders uh, where there are different perspectives at stake. Uh, it's quite difficult to do those uh, to do those uh, to do those online. Uh, just think of the the international meetings with the world leaders, where you see them all uh, on the online screen, trying to get together to mm -hmm. define a common way forward about these difficult uh, difficult topics. So this is a topic we're really interested in. So how can you use these kind of new online platforms and new online ways of communicating uh, to co-create together uh, to talk about difficult issues? And how can you nudge this process kind of in ways that, uh, yeah, that open up new possibilities? Yeah. And those are, uh, yeah, those are things we're working with now and exploring. And uh, yeah, these are difficult issues, but I think are quite, uh, quite interesting and also quite important for uh, for the future. Great, thank you, Nick. Um, Anneke, uh, <laughs> welcome also. And uh, Nick already mentioned the Global Goals Jam. Uh, this is also one of our signature events, one of our really uh, our babies, you might say. We have started this uh, five years ago and uh, you have been uh, ever since uh, coordinating this globally also. Can you explain a little bit about what it is, Global Goals Jam, and uh, what do we try to achieve with that? For Global Goals Week uh, to do that facilitated by us through a process of a toolkit that we share uh, with different locations, how to go through these two days of, uh, of designing, basically. Um, and much more, it's grown into a community where people support each other in also further missions of designing for SDGs. So not only in the weekend, but also during the year, uh, where through our Design Across Cultures Network, we set up different projects that go beyond that two days as well. Mm -hmm. um, and I would say what we're trying to achieve with the event, what started out, I think, as an activation for our network um, and also as a sort of a, a go to to see, OK, we are we are in 2015. These goals are here. What as designers can we do and what as design community can we do? Because I think that that, um, yeah, the goals weren't specifically intended for the creative community. Oh. Um, so that's a challenge there that we try to uh, <laughs> to approach, basically. Um, which is much more, more relevant over the years, uh, becoming much more relevant. And I think what, um, yeah, what now it grew out of more of an activation event is that it's also much more of a learning community as the SSS as well, mm -hmm. but more the international side. So also based on uh, these local uh, people trying to organize the event in September, trying to uh, organize it with their local community. We try to learn from them what is relevant for them. Um, why do they design what they design for? Which goals do they pick? What do they work on? What is relevant in their local community? What challenges are there? And on the other hand, we also try to facilitate cross-cultural uh, exchange, I guess, on that learning. And that's much more what we, what we are now uh, looking forward to develop. So focusing much more on, on how do we learn from each other? How do we do that in distance? And how do we do it in light of these challenges related to the SDGs, I'd say. Wonderful. Yeah, thank you, Anneke. And um, I want to ask you a follow-up question because I'm kind of obsessed with uh, with the phenomenon multiple discovery, where things you know come, pop up in different places uh, at the same time without people knowing from each other's innovations, like the pyramids. Of course, this is the ancient example. 
Um, but um, I think in the, in the Global Goals Jam, we try to do the opposite. We try to connect all of these places around the world where we try to even orchestrate this kind of simultaneous innovation. Um, but you see that I think um, in, in now in the, in the, the, the post-pandemic era, we, which we hopefully <laughs> soon will go into and move into. Um, oh, Anneke. It's me, my sound. I hope you hear me. Um, <laughs> Do you hear me? Okay, so um, where we where we used to travel, I think, around the world to go to conferences, to go to these hackathons uh, physically and, and in real life, we would diffuse our ideas physically. Uh, and we did now a Global Goals Jam uh, digitally. And what, what, what did you learn from that? And do you see a future for that kind of diffusion of innovation uh, in relation to the Global Goals? Yeah, I think what happened on a global scale also happened within the Global Goals Jam as uh, everybody needed to transfer everything online. Mm -hmm. So everybody needed to, to change and transform quite quickly, which happened, uh, which was interesting to see. Um, also, us, we needed to change because we needed to bring the toolkit online, uh, which helped a lot of people to actually then work online as well. So I think that's the first thing of, of having a shared either toolkit or a shared uh, um, beginning that you start from. And this could be a tool, it could be common goals, but having that shared is super important. On the other hand, since you're working globally, there are differences, as Nick also explained. So there should also still be a, a space uh, for locality, uh, at least in the, in the sense of the Global Goals Jam, um, where uh, you can also adapt uh, the shared tools or the shared process that you start with. So there's always this tension between, OK, what is uh, general and what is specific? Um, and I think that's also within innovations that's super relevant. You can't just say, okay, we'll make this thing, we'll implement it everywhere and it works. Uh, you'll need to adapt that. And mm -hmm. I think online can definitely have help in the sharing of it, um, but the translation locally still needs to be made. Um, and you can't forget that even when you're working digitally or online. Uh, so that's yeah. one thing. And another thing that we saw, I think, is um, that it opened up a lot more possibilities for different people to join. Strangely, actually, because it was all online. So it, it also gave us a question in like, what is still a local global goals jam? Like what, what does Japan do if people can join from all over the world? The only limit is a time zone maybe, but it's not uh, the space anymore where you're in. Right. Um, so then how do you make sure that, or what happens to that event? Is it then still a Japanese global goals jam or an Amsterdam global goals jam? Or what happens if people can join from all over the world and what's that, what does that do with the identity of the event? And I think, um, seeing how people approached uh, specifically the process and also the challenges still gave that local twist. Um, but uh, yeah, people from all over the world could join in different locations. So you got a different kind of mix of local mm. and global, which was, yeah. yeah, I think interesting. I'm not sure what we in the end like can say about that, what we learned from it, but I think maybe next year we can, we can say a bit more about that. Yeah. But, uh, it's, yeah. a, it's again that learning curve that we're in. Thank you, Anneke. Hey, Anna, sure. uh, Thank you. also welcome. Um, just like Nick, you are an anthropologist. Uh, you kind of study culture in a way, yeah? Um, so if you would have to say in this polarizing world that also Nick already mentioned, uh, we, we think differently around the world even, and it's more polarized in a way and more highlighted. How can design across cultures where there's really in the name already a direction, how can that help to have this positive transformation on this kind of polarization that we see? Um, well, I think uh, before we can answer that, I think uh, it's important to understand again what culture is. So what Nick already says, it's not just where you are from in the world, but it's all these different ways of thinking and doing, right? Uh, and that can be uh, a part of the world, but it can also be a company or maybe a government institution or perhaps like an internet community. And uh, all these groups, they uphold their own values, they have their own behaviors, and there are also different things at stake for them, yeah. right? Uh, and not just that, but they also tend to sometimes clash with uh, our own beliefs and our own behaviors. Um, so by exploring these cultures, I think um, you gain two things. First uh, is the knowledge from all these other groups because they have their own ideas about how things should be or should look like. Mm -hmm. And that can be very valuable insights also to how we go about things. Uh, and then the second point um, is that by looking at these other cultures and these other beliefs and these new insights, we also have to kind of question what we take for granted and what we think is normal um, and what we take for a fact. 
And um, so if you want to design across cultures and really want to be inclusive, it's really important that you not only explore these different beliefs, but also work together with them and not determine for them, you know, what they should think. Yeah. Uh, but really open up that conversation. And I think that's really what Design Across Cultures is about. Nice. I yeah. fully understand it now. Yeah. Thank you, Anna. And, and um, we have to end uh, this conversation. And again, we could talk for hours, <laughs> like with the last track. Um, Nick, I want to ask the final question to you. Um, globalization. Some people say it's, it failed. I hear a lot of global in your story. Uh, all three of you refer to it and uh, we as DSS also keep that really uh, close to us. What do you say in the light of your track? Uh, a difficult question, Marco. Uh, you have 30 I guess seconds. it really depends on how you uh, on how you view globalization. Of course, uh, uh, I would say if you view globalization as the spread of goods, people, and ideas across the world, uh, it's very difficult to talk about failed or not failed because mm -hmm. that has always been going on uh, since the early dawn of man. But if you uh, if you consider it the the international uh, international collaboration and building partnerships and working together globally. Uh, well, then you can, uh, yeah, you can highlight two sides, I would say, looking at, for instance, the corona crisis. Uh, on the one hand, you see an enormous potential for collaboration and globalization. Uh, just look at the scientific uh, results that have been, uh, have been achieved by, uh, by sharing, uh, sharing information and data and uh, creating a vaccine within uh, with merely a year. Uh, on the other hand, if you look at uh, the collaboration and you see how countries are dealing with, uh, with the actual vaccine, uh, you see so much siloing going on. I just read a newspaper article yesterday uh, that they're expecting uh, in uh, many African countries that uh, the vaccine will be there in 22, 23, maybe, if oh, they're lucky. Wow. <laughs> uh, so you see the, the siloing going on. And in that sense, uh, it kind of points to the, uh, to the cleavages in globalization. Uh, uh, and the internationalization is very nice from a European or, or United States perspective, perhaps. Uh, but it also creates its own walls, its own silos. Uh, so there's a lot of challenges there, I think. Yeah. Uh, and it's exactly these challenges which uh, which we like to tackle in the, in the track to see if we can break down those walls uh, and, uh, and let people work better in better and more constructive ways together in the future. Wonderful. Yeah, thank you, Nick. This is very clear. And I agree, this is a very nuanced answer to a difficult question. Um, we have to move on. Thank you so much um, for Marco. being with us and see you soon in real life. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye, bye. So um, again, um, uh, I would like to take this opportunity to highlight something. Um, the UNDP, uh, the United Nations Development Program, is one of our prime partners, also in the Design Across Cultures track and in the Global Goals Jam. And uh, our key partner there highlighted that we are actually, again, 10 years behind, we, we moved 10 years back in education, in um, uh, starvation, etc. Um, in terms of the sustainable development goals. And again, I think it's very important to talk about things like design across cultures, like systems for sharing, uh, in the light of this you know, lag that we are lagging behind already, uh, even though we just have nine years to fix everything. Um, fixing stuff. Let's go um, to the Ad Tech for Social Change, because that is one of our most active tracks at the moment. Uh, they have a very global reach. And I want to welcome uh, Dimitrios Vlachopoulos and Asia Tresiak <laughs> to the stage, the virtual stage. Hi, both. Uh, Hello, Dimi Marco. Hello. Dimitrios is program manager of the track, and uh, Asia is coach and digital transformation designer. Uh, welcome both. I want to ask again the same question, Dimitrios. Uh, I tried to already explain it in one phrase, but I think you need a bit more. Can you explain what you do at your track? Absolutely. Uh, so thank you, Marco, and thank you, everyone, for joining this session. And I'm hoping that you are enjoying also the booths with uh, our projects. So uh, our track was born just on time, I think, Marco, one year ago <laughs> to, f to deal with the pandemic. So um, the creation of this track is, um, I would like to be considered as a connective hub among researchers, educators, uh, policymakers, industry stakeholders, where every, every, together we explore how technology can be used 
to boost education and to make it accessible. So as you can understand, we work around two main pillars. The first pillar is how to make education accessible to people who belong in uh, uh, vulnerable groups. Mm -hmm. And this could be people who cannot afford education, people with disabilities, uh, people who live in uh, rural remote areas. And then uh, the second pillar is how to use technology to upskill and reskill people for the jobs of today, but also for the jobs of the future. And this will happen through the development of transversal competencies that will be needed for uh, every discipline and every uh, profession. Uh, needless to say that um, as every track at the DSS, we have as blueprint the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. And we have uh, a focus on, of course, goal number four, about quality education, but also go about reducing inequalities and sustainable uh, production and consumption. Uh, we uh, have uh, we uh, develop four main uh, types of activities. Uh, we have projects with industry partners on concrete societal challenges mm -hmm. related to education, training, and talent development. So, um, just to give an example, this semester we had. Uh, as a partner, uh, the Lectorate of Entrepreneurship at the, uh, at in Amsterdam University of Applied Sciences, where we co-designed uh, a sustainable uh, educational escape room for uh, students and uh, people who aspire to become entrepreneurs. Next semester, we are partnering with uh, the Municipality of Amsterdam, uh, Metro uh, MRA, Metropole uh, Regio Amsterdam, uh, Amsterdam Economic Board, to create a platform on um, uh, on talent development initiatives so uh, we can oversee what is happening in the Amsterdam region in terms of uh, talent development. Then we have larger scale programs and projects that uh, come from the European Commission funding like Erasmus Plus uh, or uh, the Ministry of Education. Um, uh, we have an example, our um, uh, we participate currently in two European projects. One is about how to use technology to support teachers uh, uh, being more inclusive and respecting diversity in schools. And we have another project which is about uh, um, how to use augmented reality and virtual reality in museum education with Nemo Museum as main mm -hmm. partner. Uh, the third activity we do is we design learning experiences uh, for educational institutions and companies Especially now with the pandemic, there is need for reshaping the way we train and educate. So we support them um, envision their own pedagogical model and approach. Uh, we help them choose the right technology, uh, make the right assessment for their uh, learners, and also um, secure that uh, the learners uh, uh, succeed and retain in the programs. And finally, as you already mentioned earlier, uh, we have developed a series of online courses uh, um, for trainers, educators, and uh, learning and development specialists. Wow, uh, that was a full list. So uh, <laughs> needless to say that you are very busy at the moment. And like you said, we were probably born because of the pandemic, or at least right on time. So uh, hopefully you were a little baby Jesus for a lot of people, you know. Uh, um, so I, I want to I wanna highlight a little bit um, the, the concept of EdTech. Um, I see it a lot around me. Eh? Uh, there are uh, a lot of things and, and startups also pop up ar around EdTech, educational technology. Um, but also it has been there for, for a long time already. It has been mentioned in the educational uh, field for a long time, EdTech, uh, as the way forward, as the, you know, the future. And I remember that you, um, in one of your courses, you had a lot of people attending from Africa. And I remember you mentioned like, yeah, I have to do this online course now by phone because some people didn't have access to the internet or to, to some, a system uh, that could actually run the software for EdTech. Uh, how, how can we, you know, how, what, what is your view on this difference? And can we talk about EdTech for social change if the differences are so big? Well, uh, there are a lot of uh, differences and uh, overall uh, the pandemic brought a lot of disruption in every level of education from early childhood to higher education. It, it even uh, provoked disruption to online education institutions where uh, the, the administrative and support staff had to work remotely. Uh, so um, we, I think um, during the last 
uh, almost one year, we trained more than 3,000 people from all over the world. And um, the success of our training wasn't so much the content itself, because there are so many training courses available and so many tools, and most of them are free and so many tutorials. But uh, I think we tackled what you just mentioned, that uh, we didn't uh, prepare just the training, but we tailored it to our audience's needs. So uh, uh, the needs of an African teacher in, in Ghana, which was the case, and we trained more than 1,500 people there from uh, uh, schools of um, colleges and secondary education teachers, so are totally different. So we tried uh, uh, to uh, give them the information that they currently need to be successful at this particular moment. Mm -hmm. Then when you have uh, higher education professionals with experience in online learning from Canada, automatically uh, the focus is on, on different skill development and on different uh, knowledge acquisition. However, I, I truly believe that uh, we have been successful mostly because we focused on the community building part, on um, uh, sharing doubts, explaining that there are no recipes, there are no recipes applicable for all. This is a community that we built and uh, through uh, exchange of good practices but also exchange of concerns and problems, I think we managed to be very effective and, and support our partners and learners. Thank you so much, Dimitrios. Hey, Asia, welcome uh, to the stage also. Thank uh, you for having me. You actually joined us during the pandemic, so uh, that is weird. <laughs> um, that was, of course, a challenge by itself. And Dimitrios already highlighted a lot of the things that you work on have a highly collaborative, uh, you know, dynamic. And in your work and in your previous work also, you have had a lot of focus on coaching and collaboration. Um, how would you say that translated to the projects that you have worked on and uh, what did you learn from working and collaborating in this strange time that can be translated perhaps even? Right. Uh, thank you for having me and welcome everybody. Um, yeah, it's a very good question. So uh, an interesting thing is that uh, there is a big overlap between uh, online collaboration and what it was in the past. For me personally, I think there are two things that I always find important. Um, the first one is uh, there is a lot of trust uh, from the get-go. So I see the trainees and whoever I collaborate with online or offline as a resourceful person with unique uh, set of skills. So I think that is super important. And um, another thing is really to recognize uh, everybody's motivation, desired way of working, um, and respect that, right? And try to work together, not uh, despite these differences, but uh, while embracing them. Uh, what is different, I think, in, in virtual collaboration, what I what I've noticed is mainly that uh, there is more focus or stress on well-being. So investing in, I think, investing in uh, in um, teamwork just costs uh, more time and needs more attention. If it's via Zoom, if it's via Teams, uh, or even collaborating on Miro. So, um, you know, face to face, it happens more organically. And when we do it online, we just have to mm -hmm. put more effort, put more time into it. Yeah. Yeah, that is a clear difference. I, I even noticed it in preparing this showcase. I mean, it's so much work. Uh, you Absolutely. Have to, you, you, and you also feel that there is less space, I think, for mistakes. Uh, so there's everything stands out. Just even uh, just an observation uh, when you are uh, on the screen, you see yourself and you're always there and people always look at you in their periphery of their eyes. So there is almost no mistake even in your facial expression. And this is, of course, one of the things that in collaboration is, uh, is one of the key things. Facial expression is uh, really uh, detailed and uh, subtle, usually. Hey, so, Asya, um, uh, just uh, uh, one big question for you also, because I asked a few big questions for Dimitrios. What, in your opinion, is the future of learning uh, when you have everything that we learn now in your backpack? And uh, what, how, what will you do actually to coach that right. as a coach? 
That's a, that's a difficult question, but I think there are a few things that have been mentioned today already. Mm -hmm. uh, so Dimitrio said there is no recipe, right? Uh, I think Frank at the beginning also said we need to maybe slow down, rethink education. And what I've recently read uh, in the book called The Art of Gathering, um, Priya Parker said uh, that in the world of infinite ch um, choices, just choosing one thing is already a revolutionary act. Mm -hmm. um, so I think um, maybe we should just simplify things and um, choose wisely and think what do we want, you know, for ourselves as a professional or as a learner, what do we want for our community and um, I think it's beautiful actually what we do at DSS that we put it in a framework of the sustainable development goals, right, mm -hmm. because we, we think beyond that. But my main message would be um, no recipe, the same as Demetrius, simplify and maybe slow down and rethink everything. Oh, that is a nice statement. Slow down, rethink, reflect, and at the same time, follow all of the 1500 courses that you are developing <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and trying to put across uh, in the world. Thank you so much, uh, EdTech for Social Change Track, uh, Demetrius and Asia, and see you soon, hopefully in real life again. Thank you very much. Take Thank care. You. All right. Um, it's 4.30. We are moving, uh, I think, uh, right on schedule. So we are now also moving to the next track. And this is special because this is a new track. Uh, it's a track that focuses on Digital Twin. And if you don't know what Digital Twin is, you have to ask Shauna. Please, Shauna, join the stage uh, by... Hi, Shauna. Hi, Marco. Nice to have you. Shauna is our new uh, project pro uh, program manager of the, the Digital Twin um, um, uh, track. If you need to explain to people Digital Twin, because I had to explain it already to a lot of people and even to myself, what is that? Yeah, so uh, thanks for having me, first of all. Um, so Digital Twins are basically virtual representations of uh, physical products, uh, people, processes, or systems, and they're um, used to at least you know simulate and predict or inform and ultimately steer and influence their real life uh, counterparts. Um, but I also think that the word twin is a bit misleading because it can never really be a full representation, um, but really depending on the mm -hmm. underlying goal and the data that can be collected. So if you think about a photograph, it's not a rep representation of you fully. Yeah. Okay, this is clear. And so, so often uh, it is uh, kind of confused or at least uh, uh, used with uh, visualization and, and perhaps visualizations of things or simulations. Um, wh what is the difference, uh, if you have to say? Um, so I think the difference is that um, you have the simulation or model, but at the same time it's collecting um, data, mm -hmm. uh, which is modifying that. and. Um, and then, and then creating these uh, insights or predictions that then you can make um, decisions off of. Uh, so if you look at, for example, um, manufacturing example, uh, that you, know, you can use digital twins across the whole life cycle uh, from the design phase um, to optimize design, to simulate how it will act in the real world, to um, the use phase where you can um, do predictive maintenance or uh, do your asset management. Um, so. Um, mm -hmm. This is the power of digital twins. Right. So uh, there is a power. Eh? There is. It is a force to be reckoned with. Um, and at the same time, you, we have already highlighted a, a couple of times now in this talk show that the sustainable development goals are central in the way we work. So sustainability, in the broader sense, as Stefan over also highlighted, uh, is something we want to work towards. How do digital twins fit this story of sustainability? What can we do with that technology? Yeah, so I think it has um, the potential to contribute to all of the sustainable de development goals, um, but also to go against them. It's kind of a double-edged sword. Mm. Um, in terms of good, the digital twins can really contribute to you know, the smart cities, the circular economy. So that touches on, for example, um, goal nine, industry, innovation, and infrastructure. Um, goal 11, sustainable cities and communities. Uh, goal 12, of course, responsible consumption and production. And in terms of the bad, we can also think about how these technologies are being misused by um, big business or governments, and this can really chip away at our institutions as well, or fragment our attention, um, or drive us to more consumerism. Nice. Okay, and, and um, uh, your track is, of course, very new. 
So what are the next steps? What, what are you working on to start up this track in at least now and perhaps in the next six months? Yep, so we're going to be following in the footsteps and building on the insights from the previous tracks that are really related, like, for example, the physical to digital track or the data-driven transformation track. Um, and I know that we're looking at topics, for example, that um, data is not objective, um, even though we act like it is. And I think we're going to be trying to explore big topics like, you know, who will digital twins serve? You know, for example, the original use case for manufacturing was to predict, optimize, and control, but when we zoom out to a societal level, we have to think about, well, who's in control or who or what is being controlled? Um, and then if we also think about the predictions, how good can they be? You know, COVID interrupted a lot of our prediction industry, um, which, you know, I think causes us to reflect. Mm -hmm. So, um, and another piece is, I think, about the co-evolution of us next to technology, um, because we we also become shaped by technology as we shape it ourselves. Um, like if we think about Facebook or Twitter, um, that they may, may be a digital twin of uh, our culture, that those are actually modifying us as well. And if we flip that around, how can we use these technologies to actually enable a world that we would like to live in to achieve the SDGs? Um, and here we can really take a speculative approach to explore and interrogate these potential futures. What is desirable? What do we want to avoid? Mm -hmm. Um, and also to apply this thinking very practically to the work that we'll do with organizations. This is very interesting. I think um, if you talk about data and, uh, and, and privacy, for example, eh, um, in relation to privacy, um, uh, can digital twin also be under the loop of this kind of ethical way of thinking? Um, should we be afraid of digital twins? Um, because I, I'm, I'm sure there will be criticism at one point because there's a lot of data going on um, and, and through the digital twins. Absolutely. I, I think that's uh, one of the key aspects as well because um, technologies like uh, algorithms and big data and you know, IoT, all of the issues that are inherent on those, um, those technologies, those, those are all enabling technologies mm -hmm. for digital twins. So uh, we have to definitely reflect on all of those things. Yeah. And what are the main themes that you want to work on in the next uh, years to come? Uh, this is like a, a shout out to people perhaps that are viewing this and uh, saying, hey, well, this is interesting. It's a track I want to collaborate with or be involved in. Um, who can join and, and what can they do? How can they partner up with you? Yeah, so of course, anybody can join and there's different ways to join. Um, you can be a partner if you're an organization. Um, you can be an expert or ambassador if uh, you want to dedicate your time and you're already working on this topic. You can, of course, uh, join um, as a trainee um, and also, um, well, tell me if I missed anything, Marco. Of course, in the community, and also yeah. we'll, we will be developing also educational modules that you know share and open up the discussion. Uh, so yeah, many ways to join. Thank you so much, Shauna. This is, uh, I think, important so that we have a, a shout out to everybody who wants to join the track because uh, it's only you on the screen now, but we're growing, and I'm sure you're building the team uh, as we speak. So uh, we will probably be in touch soon again and hear from you. Uh, wonderful having you and welcome. Also, you joined during the pandemic, but it's, uh, it's, it's nice to actually know, uh, get to know each other also uh, like this. Thank you so much, yeah, You only know the digital twin of me. Exactly, uh, Marco. exactly. I know you <laughs> so well. <laughs> There's a lot of data happening between us already. Thank you so much, Shana. Um, we'll uh, take a, a very short break. I want to go to um, Jeroen. Jeroen, is there anything happening on the chat? Um, it's actually quiet in chat. I asked chat a question, and I, I, I think they're all visiting the booths, which is which is wonderful. Which is wonderful because but you can see our show later. We can share yeah. the video, so yeah. this is awesome. Um, what I would propose is that we maybe uh, show a video so that we yeah. can relax our face muscles. Just we have we have some time now uh, to to watch a video on uh, digital transformation design and uh, some of our previous trainees and digital transformation designers share what they learned and what their experience was with Digital Society School. And after that, I want to uh, um, start a conversation with a very special guest, also Carola Verschoor. She is a founder of Transformational Studios. And uh, we will see if we can get her on the virtual stage in, uh, in the meantime. See you in a couple of minutes. Uh, 
My name is Mickey Youngling and I'm a digital transformation designer. I'm Ilaria Zonda from Italy. My name is Abdurrahman Hassan and I'm a digital transformation designer. There is a lot of technology that's difficult for the majority of people to understand how to use it. Everything that's happening now, all these developments, how can we make sure that this happens in an ethical way? The importance of digital transformation is that it has to be inclusive and that it affects everyone's reality. You, your digital literacy shapes the world. What we're trying to do is to educate the new generation of learners to really know how to integrate technology with sustainability and how to improve lives uh, instead of just making them uh, optimized. And my name is Lama Ahmad Salah and my role is a graphic designer. Um, my name is Martin Vanderwolf and I'm uh, currently a hardware developer. My name is Mari Pinheiro and I'm an industrial designer. Organized chaos, I guess. <laughs> Meeting people from different places of the world and then learning from different cultures while engaging in projects that are meaningful for the world. Uh, if you ever need feedback, there's a lot of different like perspectives you can get. The sustainable development goals are essential for everybody, so everybody should know about them. They define issues that are so global that everyone can relate to them, but then also a little bit vague that you can embed your local context inside. The world needs to connect, and that's why digital society is so special, is because they have people from all over the world tackling these uh, global issues. We link up the projects that we're having to these goals to make sure that that's a way we can measure the impact that we're having and also see the bigger picture of what we're working on. So I learned that it's very important for you to talk about your project with someone else. The creative mindset, the adaptive mindset. Don't think too much, so do more. I learn from the different backgrounds and I believe that everybody has something to share from their own unique backgrounds, especially different cultures. In five to ten years from now, everyone will have to have that agile mentality, that fast-moving, dynamic mentality, or else they they will perish. Fun. Critical. Creativity. Creative chaos. Helpful. Proactive. Future-proof. Open. Innovation. Light-hearted. Problem-solving. Critical. Inspiring. Inclusive. Forward-thinking. Uh, liberating. And it's nice to be part of it. How do we become the trailblazer for the change that needs to happen in our industry? Um, my name is Mickey Youngling and I'm a digital transformation designer. I'm Ilaria Zonda from Italy. My name is Abdurrahman Hassan and I'm a digital transformation designer. There is a lot of technology that's difficult for the majority of people to understand how to use it. Everything that's happening now, all these developments, how can we make sure that this happens in an ethical way? The importance of digital transformation. Welcome back, everybody. Um, sorry for just, uh, I think you saw one minor twitch in our, uh, uh, our broadcast. But I want to welcome you and also welcome Carola Verschoor to the stage. I briefly mentioned her before already as uh, founder of Transformational Studios and a dear friend. So welcome, Carola. Hi, Marco. Hello, good afternoon. So it's, uh, we've known each other for a long time already. Um, and actually, Are you counting? No, no, I'm not counting, but uh, a long time. <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps you have seen me with hair even. Is that possible? That is even possible, All yes. Right. Those were the days. <laughs> those were the days, indeed. Hey, so one of those uh, occasions was that you launched your book, Change Your Hat, which is a wonderful read. I would recommend it to everybody. And I was lucky enough to be one of the, the readers and the reviewers, uh, and um, and share that with uh, with with an audience also. And since then, you actually moved from change ahead to more transformational studios. And in between, you've done a lot of things, had a lot of positions, and perhaps you can uh, explain a little bit more about that later. Uh, but also, the words say something. I thought it was striking that you moved from change to transformation. And I've read a lot of books that actually try to explain the difference between change and transformation. Is there also a difference that you see and perhaps even in the journey that you took that you see this change? Yeah, I think that the, there's, a, there's a word, there's a third word missing in this, uh, oh, Richie, uh, in this comparison. Richie, can you switch off your camera? Yeah. Sorry? 
now someone uh, a previous guest uh, <laughs> came in <laughs> we were bombed right. <laughs> perhaps he or she had an answer to the question <laughs> in that case they're welcome <laughs> to pitch in uh, but i'd like to introduce a third word so change transformation and the third word is growth mm -hmm. so i think that for a large part of of my career the focus of on change was linked to uh, the unrelenting search for growth primarily in the business sector but even uh, non-governmental sectors, even public sector enterprises were looking for growth. And so the reason why they sought change is um, in order to make that growth possible. And where my point of view has really kind of transmuted into a new definition um, comes with the fact that I think that transformation is much deeper mm -hmm. and is much uh, more sustainable than just chasing growth and chasing change mm -hmm. in order to achieve growth for growth's sake. So transformation is more ecosystemic, it's more um, uh, sort of has a mid to long term approach and includes not only the the quantifiable metrics but also a sense of purpose and a sense of making that change last and making that change impactful mm -hmm. so that is really my personal view and how I have experienced it as a professional um, but it's quite interesting that you see also in our clients um, that people are no longer looking just for the uh, gimmicky changey thing for change's uh, sake rather uh, they're looking to be uh, transformative in the things that they do and in their endeavors in order to deliver more positive impact and i think this is this is a good progress that we're yeah. making definitely and and also in the word or in the experience of the word there's also movement i think there's a dynamic element to it would you also say that this uh, movement is something that you work on professionally? Uh, do you try to actually stir up or engage people to actually move towards transformation? And how do you do that? No, so so uh, the, the short answer to that is no, I, I'd never do that because I think that um, the degree to which we can transform is related to our awareness with the need for transformation mm -hmm. um, and quite typically what triggers a transformational uh, project or a transformational endeavor is either a huge sense of urgency so things have stopped working and we have to do things differently mm -hmm or an uh, incredible alluring vision of what the future might look like and uh, either or uh, they appeal to human motivation and if that is missing no transformational effort will ever deliver the actual transformation because transformation necessitates that we transform we transform our way of thinking we transform our behaviors we transform our way of doing and we transform our way of engaging with others in order to create positive impact that really has to come from the person wanting to look for an alternative mm -hmm. wanting to transform and it cannot be imposed because then it's just change yeah <laughs> And, and, and actually, we are working on a course together. Uh, this is one of our collaborations at the moment between Digital Side School and Transformational Studios uh, on a course on transformation design. So without imposing people, uh, of course, we will ask them to join that course. And that course has been built, of course, together with, uh, with a certain perspective. Could you explain a little bit about what transformation design is um, um, in, in general and also how that course is built up so that people can actually learn how to design for transformation, so to speak. Yeah, so um, as, as we discussed, uh, as we were creating the course, transformation design is not new, mm -hmm. uh, but transformation design is very relevant and very current because it is integrative. And by that we mean that we use uh, design tooling and design thinking, um, as it is popularly known, uh, in the context of creating transformative 
positive change within the digital society and we do this by bringing all kinds of disciplines to allow us to contextualize and understand the underlying problem so that the transformation is really deep and is really lasting um, and one of the key precepts on which we, we based the creation of the course is that in a context of turbulence, in a context of unpredictability in which we were seeing systemic collapse, we're seeing very high complexity, in this context strategy is either transformational or it isn't strategy. Mm -hmm. And so actually there is a compelling need to look at strategy in a different way, actually to transform the way strategy is done. And the what we propose through the course is to show people how to use design in an applied way in order to generate the strategies that will allow us to deal with the complexity that we're having to deal with and help us become transformative agents, help us become stewards of the future that we all wish to be a part of. Yeah, wonderful. And, and, and uh, it's a joy to work on this course also because it is so multifaceted and it's also, of course, work to, to work together. But um, if we would have to describe who could join, what, what kind of people are we looking for? What would you say? I'd say that uh, we're looking at people working in all kinds of institutions, so businesses, public uh, sector, um, uh, non-governmental organizations that feel that we have to start addressing the challenges of our era, the, the challenges of our age in a new way. So you're starting to realize that just kind of patching things is not sufficient in order to create uh, the kind of, of future um, that you wish for in the context of the digital society. Mm -hmm. And what this means is that you really come to understand that complexity is uh, uh, causing you to have to raise the bar to go beyond yourself and you want to engage in things that are not only innovative for the sake of being innovative but are really uh, allowing you and your organization to align and to adapt and to synchronize to the needs of society in the broader sense of the word in this day and age. And this means that you understand that the value that we create through our work, through our profession, is much more a shared value because we all share the impact of the things that we do. Mm -hmm. um, you're probably someone who is trying to understand how do I help my organization create the strategy and design the strategic levers that are going, allow, going to allow us to make this transformation possible. We're in an age in which probably the key skill of our time is really about the capacity to imagine and to co-create that future. So if you want to learn how to do that through transformation design, uh, this is the place to be because it's fun, it's engaging. And as you said, Marco, it's been a real joy to uh, to design this course and to co-develop this course together. Because even though we know one another for so long, uh, we're engaging in much deeper, much more meaningful discussions. And it's been a, a transformative experience even for us creating it. <laughs> yeah, rightly so. Uh, so if, if we talk about this readaptive learning, as you described, I think, uh, so we might even call it readaptive learning so that we you know, uh, learn how to readapt uh, continuously. Um, if you would have to, and I've asked this question to other people as well in the in this talk show, if you would have to envision the, the future of learning, because of course we did this course online, uh, there's a, a learning platform, we are trying to have peer-to-peer -peer interaction, um, assignments, individual parts, uh, more, uh, more public parts uh, in sessions. Um, is that the future or what, what would you say, what are you hoping for in terms of learning what, and us as educators perhaps? Yeah, well you know that I personally am a super eager learner uh, oh, yeah. all the time. How many books I've, did I've you read stopped. again, uh, Carola, this year? Uh, so in 2020, more than 100 books. Uh, I mean, yeah. it's, it's <laughs> <laughs> I'm not just wearing these glasses uh, yeah. as a fashion statement. <laughs> no, but but uh, all kidding aside, um, I think that the future of learning um, is engaging with our capacity to ask questions. So it's engaging with our capacity to say, I don't know. And as I referred just now to co-creation and imagination as key skills, 
uh, the ability to, to wonder what else could be. Um, learning in the future will be much more about experimenting in a purposeful way. So it's for me, if you need sort of a very succinct way of summarizing what's learning in the future, it's purposeful experimentation. And it's not just, you know, throwing something out there, but it's really based on what you know, based on what you uh, would like to know more about and wonder about, and based on the question that comes after the question that you are now raising, trying things out, learning, uh, um, looking for different perspectives, looking to um, invalidate all of those things that seem so uh, certain so that you can start co-adapting with the needs of the environment and doing things that are meaningful, that are relevant, while combining them with a sense of purpose. So uh, my take on this is purposeful experimentation. Wonderful. And one of the pers purposeful experiments I think we are undertaking soon is that, and, uh, and it's also a new learning instrument, uh, we are starting or revamping our Dear Future I'm Ready podcast. And we're do going to do that together. And I wanted you to give the announcement to you. So perhaps you can announce the new episodes and the new series that we are going to, uh, to create it's very soon. All right. <laughs> <laughs> so it's super exciting. Uh, I'm very, very happy to uh, to share with you all that I am going to help uh, co-host the uh, Dear Future I'm Ready podcast for the next season. And what we're going to do is we're going to talk to 21, no more, no more, no less, <laughs> 21 thought leaders about the challenges of the 21st century. So it's uh, the setting is 2021. We're going to talk to 21 thought leaders do 21 interviews and talk about the challenges of the 21st century. And these challenges are along the topics of design, innovation, digital technologies, sustainability, uh, diversity, inclusion, and more. And to you guys that are listening uh, right now, um, if there are topics that you want us to discuss that you think you shouldn't miss out on these topics if you're going to talk about what matters to be ready because it's about being ready for the future. Mm -hmm. um, share it with us and we'll try and in include these topics within the interviews. We're, comp we're compiling a list. Uh, the names are probably, you, you suspect that you might know who is there and some of them are kind of big idols of, of Marco and myself. But if you have suggestions of people that we should interview, of course, let us know as well. Uh, we're super excited. We think that this is going to uh, bring a lot of very good explorations and conversations as to, you know, how we together are going to co-develop and co-shape that future mm -hmm. that we're also ready for, but also that demands so much of us in, um, you know, daring to purposefully experiment and explore. <laughs> Hashtag. Hey, thank you so much, Carola. <laughs> if, you, if I would have to ask yes. you... Uh, Thank you. To, to finish the circle that we started this morning with Frank Kressin, our wonderful dean and uh, biggest fan. Uh, well, you're also a fan. But uh, he was very optimistic in his advice for our trainees and our learning community. Would you also share that optimism and have some and share some advice with them for if you say, dear future, I'm ready. What should they take along with them? So the best way to uh, to be ready for the future is to uh, be open-minded, to be curious, um, and to be ready to enjoy uh, all of the things that you try out and you explore as you uh, uh, engage with the future. And the place where you engage for the future is, of course, the present moment. Um, so every time you do something, see it as the next step that is bringing you closer uh, to the future and uh, try and enjoy it as much as possible. Thank you so much, Carola. We are going to finish this conversation now and I'm going to end uh, officially also uh, the showcase and the talk show. But it was wonderful to have you as a final guest and um, well, hope to see you soon again in real life. Uh, Always delighted to be here. Thank you so much. See you soon, Carola. Thank you. So that was Carola Verschoor at Transformational Studios. Can everybody switch on their camera again so we can say goodbye together? Yeah, there's everybody. Wonderful to see so many faces. Uh, and Carola also knows that there's a, a group of people around her, actually. <laughs> She's not alone. <laughs> um, I want to finish this uh, wonderful showcase. And I hope you enjoyed the sessions and also the booths with the projects and with the trainees and that you have engaged in purposeful 
experimental conversations with them. And um, Jeroen, thank you so much also for uh, moderating. Are there things from the chat that you want to highlight to finish well, up with? Uh, when people return to the stage, they started answering the question about their digital twins and uh, one person was actually worried whether he w would lose the fight with his digital twin. Right. And there were obviously <laughs> people that, that, that were worried about whether their Hive's digital twin from 20 years ago would become public at some point. Uh, but yeah, I, I think that on the whole, uh, digital twins are an exciting thing and, yeah. and something that people are not cognizant of enough yet and that is becoming more to the forefront these days so yeah it's uh, been a great a great afternoon again uh, yeah, thanks, every show showcases wonderful and uh union is always very much involved with the program uh, digital transformation intensive and uh, I, I know you also enjoy to uh, have been interacting with these people for a long time yep. uh, with the trainees so you're probably going to miss them right uh, i'm going to miss them awfully uh fortunately we have a going way party virtually unfortunately this Friday so uh, I don't have to say goodbye to them just yet <laughs> uh, but yeah. yeah it's it's gonna be a tough week after that we'll raise a glass definitely all right thank you you uh, I want to thank uh, other people as well of course I want to thank all the partners that actually believed in us also in this strange time to invest in us also in their time and of course also uh, with their uh, investment and uh, working with us. They spend a lot of hours working with us and spend a lot of hours with the trainees. So we are very grateful for that. Obviously, I want to thank the teams, the trainees, uh, for working so hard on distance, but making it actually work. And actually, like we already noticed in the beginning, actually feel so much connection. And also we felt that connection too. I want to thank the DSS team, uh, our team, uh, who often had to combine household, kids, uh, you know, far away family that they had to connect to or find ways to connect to and many other things. Uh, much respect for everybody that work with us and obviously also the faculty that we are part of and the Amsterdam University of Applied Sciences for believing in us, for being our biggest sponsors and uh, yeah, biggest fans, you might also say. So uh, this means also that usually the end of this, uh, this semester also means that we are gearing up for new projects. We are gearing up for new courses. We are uh, trying to uh, mold new collaborations and would love to work with you. So if you have ways you think you can work with us, please uh, contact us, go to our website or already start chatting with Jeroen uh, in the, in the hop-in uh, so we can guide you to the right person. Um, well, it was wonderful to have the showcase. Um, actually, the time flew. A lot of interesting people passed by and I enjoyed it very much. Um, stay safe, stay sane. And uh, like, uh, like I already mentioned, rushed off in Team Human. He says, find the others. But far first find us first and then we will find the others together to team up for a better future. Thank you so much. It's five o'clock exactly. This was the showcase 2021 and see you soon. Dear future. 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 I'm ready. This is dear future. I'm ready. Dear future. I'm ready.